Before we get into the word today, I want to let you know that our Sunday night at 6 o'clock tonight, we're going to have our worldview night, and uh, Mitch is going to uh, tackle, uh, in probably a more of the- theological way, judgment. And so that's what, what's going to be on tonight. I think he's going to do two, he's going to do one this month and one next month. There's just too much there, so I just wanted to let you know about that. Praise the Lord. So yeah, for the last, uh, you know, as you know, we were gone for a while, and uh, I just want to say again, I was so thankful for all the word that came forth. It was just so good as I watched our, our church online, and it was like being here, and uh, all those powerful words that came forth. So last week was another powerful word. It was uh, about fighting for our families. And we have a YouTube channel. You can go there and re-listen to any, anything you want, anytime you want. And while you're there, subscribe to it. But last week, uh, fighting for our families. And then I want to just uh, bring to our attention again a message by uh, our worship leader. Uh, I don't know how many weeks ago now, but uh, Andy brought a message on the Holy Spirit. So powerful. Because I'm going to just, uh, by the help of God, tie some things together today about the Holy Spirit, about fighting for our families. Uh, and just about things that we need to run this race. So uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, is our helper. You've probably heard that before. And last week we heard about fighting for our families. So we could say this, that one way to fight for our families, if we're going to do it, we want to do it in the Spirit, we want to do it by the Spirit, and we want to do it with the Spirit. And Because there's different ways to fight. And, uh, and I, you know, I wasn't always a Christian I did get saved at the age of 23, so I I didn't have many years outside of God, but I did have those, the years from 18 to 23, those five years of running around, going to, back then they were discotheques, uh, getting into mischief and all that kind of stuff. And I I wasn't really a brawler, and my brother Joe liked to fight, and my brother Mike liked to fight, but I, I, you know, you see it out there in the world when people get in arguments and they fight, and it's just like flesh, you know, punches and yelling and screaming. And most of the time, it doesn't solve anything. It actually complicates it more and makes it worse. But then when we fight for families and friends and loved ones in the spirit and by the spirit, it's the opposite of flesh, and it can bring great change and results. So we're just going to look into some of that today. Uh, I just know um, that there's a kind of prayer that I want to highlight today And I think it's important for the entire body of Christ to know about this prayer. Uh, And sometimes there's uh, various views and debates about this kind of prayer. But I'm going to go with the word of God today and present this kind of prayer. And uh, and I I just, I'm going to trust the Lord to bring understanding to it. That's not my, you know, as we see in the scripture, my responsibility is to plant. And then others can come along and water but it's God that gives the increase. So I can't give an increase, but I can plan. So we're going to do that today. So um, what we're going to do today, I'm just going to do uh, share along these lines. Here's where we're going. I'm going to just do prayer highlights from my life, let you know some things that happened in my life and how they helped me. And then uh, we're going to look at some scripture about the Holy Spirit helping us concerning prayer. Then we're going to go into the book of Acts and look at the urgency of the early apostles concerning the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to uh, finish off by saying, I'm going to let you know how I was filled with the Spirit and how you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's where we're going today. So just some prayer highlights from my life. Some of you already know this, but I was born again in 1979. So I was 23 years old at the time when I received Jesus back in 1979. It was life-changing. Uh, I think you've heard this before, but I was a miserable guy. I worked in a machine shop. I was a machinist by trade at the time. And I just was miserable. Maybe one reason is because I worked midnight turn and afternoon turn and not, I didn't have enough seniority to work day turn. So when when everyone was out playing and I was driving to work in the summertime and I saw people jumping in swimming pools, I was like on the way to work. That in itself was a challenge, uh, working the afternoon shift and the midnight shift. But I don't know, I was miserable probably because I didn't have God. So I frequently use the F word. I've said that before. F was, the F word was a common word for me. One of the guys at work told me, he was a, 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 a Christian. He said, why don't you just curse God and die? He said, you're so miserable. That, that was me before I found him, the Lord Jesus. So then I found him. And me, amazing, like the new birth when I received Jesus as Lord, I did not want to say that F word any longer. 
Now, I did slip a few times, but I didn't want to. And I went and got forgiveness for that. But my want to change, you know, the, the want to changes, what you want to do after you receive him, you no longer want to do. Some people slip and do it, but then they go get forgiveness. So that happened with me. Then, uh, I don't know how many months later, I, uh, I, my, I, tried to, I tried to receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues after I was saved because I heard my brother's testimony. And, and I thought the same thing would happen to me, and it didn't happen. So, um, so it was down the road, uh, I don't know how many months, and I'm going to tell you more about it later, how that happened and the last thing we look at. But I just would go to the Lord and say, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and it, nothing happened. But then it happened about two or three months later. But then right after that happened, that was life-changing, being saved was life-changing, but I didn't really know what to do with the Holy Spirit once I received the Holy Spirit, because I was a baby Christian. So we're going to look at some scriptures today, and we're going to look into this and just see exactly what we have and how God wants to help us. I found the first church. It was a Pentecostal church. You guys might have heard that. I went to the Yellow Pages, and I found an Italian pastor, and I thought, hey, there's other Italians that are actually not Catholic. So that's the only reason we went to the church. We didn't know anything about it. I just said, Joe, like there's an, another Italian that's a born-again Christian. Let's go here. So we went for that reason, just because of an Italian there. And uh, then it was a Pentecostal church. We didn't know that, so we walked right into that. And um, we, that's back in the days you had a Sunday night service and everyone gathered around at the end and you just came up. But it was mainly like crying and begging God. So we had a lot of crying. Now, the first time that you cry, it really... The emotional part, you know, I think, man, that was really good. I cried. But, you know, when you just cry all the time after a while, you know, it, it, you realize, okay, I, you know, the crying's not doing much. But so that was kind of like there. Then, then the Lord spoke to us, and my brother and I, we moved a 1,000 miles, and we went to Bible school. And so then at Bible school, they had prayer school. Actually, she, Patsy wasn't my wife at the time, but she's the one that conducted prayer school. Actually, she didn't like me back then. But I, <laughs> then she saw the light. But anyway, <laughs> but I would go to prayer school, and I would listen, and I would observe, and I, and I watched people pray. Because I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I really didn't do a whole lot with it. So this is where I, this is like a season in my life where I started to watch and observe and learn, Okay. Then, uh, a f then I, a, f a few years later, still single, there was a Monday night prayer meeting that Brother Hagen began to have on Monday nights. And uh, he, one of the purposes of that prayer meeting was uh, we did it every Monday. Even though we might have prayed for other things, near the end of that prayer meeting, we prayed for Russia and China, that the communist, communism would fall. And we did that on a consistent basis on Monday night. And... Uh, and what I was started to see and learn there is that Brother Hagen would say, I'm going to pray this in my understanding, and then after I pray in my understanding, after I pray the best way that I can with my understanding, then we're going to pray in the Holy Spirit, and we're going to take some time to pray this out. And see, this is like, this is all new to me. You know, I, I didn't grow up that way. So I just watched and I observed. And, but then I started to do, that's when I started to do also in that prayer meeting. And so what started to happen, there was a blending together for me of praying in your understanding, but then also praying in the spirit. Those two things started to blend together. And I think this is important for every Christian to know because if you only pray in your understanding, and believe me, a lot of good things happen if you have a scriptural promise and you take a scripture and you feed on it and you pray it, it's wonderful. But then there's also this other kind of prayer that's also wonderful. And so it started to, where these two things started to blend together. So I'll explain it as I go if this is like really new for you. So, you know, we, we, then I got into the singing band and we start traveling. And uh, it was a real doing season for me because we would set up in an auditorium. It might be a stadium. That's back when there were really big meetings and uh, we would set up in stadiums and some big auditoriums. We had book tables and we sold books. Uh, like this book wasn't written back then, but I'm going to let you know about it a little later. It's what I'm teaching on today. You see how thick that is. You can really get a lot from this book. We have over 30 of them in our bookstore. Um, 
but, but we would sell, we, before we opened the bookstore and began to sell the books, we would go into a room, our, our music group and, and the team that served, and we would just pray for an hour straight. That's really the first time I ever start praying like an hour straight, nonstop. And you know, at first it's not easy. You know, like you start praying and you, you think like 20 minutes, and then you look and there's only five minutes that went by. I'm just being honest. It took a little while to build into that praying for an hour straight, you know. And then you start, and then your mind, you know, you think you pray five minutes and you start thinking, I'm going to make a to-do list because, you know, like you're wondering, you know. So it took a little while to do that. So we're not talking about works and doing, we're, you know, anything I'm talking about today isn't to gain God's love. He loved us while we were sinners. It isn't to gain more favor with him in a sense. You know, we do these things because we want to do them. God loves us, okay? So just to make that clear. So all of this said, let's look at this scripture and start off here today. So this is scripture about the Holy Spirit helping us. And I, and I learned this kind of prayer as I was going along. So Romans eight twenty six it says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Notice the Spirit helps us. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Okay, so there's praying in your understanding. Then there's another way that we can pray that's actually, it says it's too deep for words. So I know that out in the body of Christ, there's various views on this. Here's an example, like what I dealt with. I worked alongside a man at the machine shop, and he was witnessing to me all the time. And he was a Baptist guy, and, uh, and he was, and I was Catholic, and he just thought I was a, just a Catholic sinner that needed to get saved, and he was correct. <laughs> and, uh, and so I actually was made redundant. Our, our factory didn't have enough work, so I was made redundant. I was able to collect some, uh, uh, you know, we called it unemployment back, and it's called the stipend here. I, I can't remember what it's called here, but I was able to collect that. So I, I was okay financially. I got called back to work. But when I was made redundant, that's when I became a Christian. And then I also got filled with the Holy Spirit. So it was a, and the, during those months. So I came back to work, and I thought, when I see him, I'm going to let him know. And I said, hey, guess what? I'm a born-again Christian. And he goes, all right. And I said, and I'm filled with the Spirit, and I speak in tongues. And he goes, that's of the devil. <laughs> and you know, and I thought, man, like, like you, you th I thought you'd be happy that I'm saved, but now you're telling me something's of the devil, and I thought, you can't tell me. I, and he knew the way I was, you know, the way that I, the, I was miserable and said the F word all the time, and I thought, you can't tell me the devil's given this stuff out where I received Jesus as Lord, I no longer wanted to use that F word, I wanted to live a holy life. The devil's not passing that kind of stuff out. You, so you, you're not going to be able to do that to me and think I'm going to believe that, you know. So, here we see that the Spirit, God gave his Holy Spirit, and the Spirit wants to help us in our weaknesses. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. So there's like, there's times that something might be going on with a loved one, a family member, and you don't really know how to pray for that. But the Holy Spirit wants to help us in those ways. Then there could be like a decision you need to make, and the Holy Spirit wants to help you make that decision. You might not know how to pray. There might be like opportunities set before you, like you have something you have to choose. Is this the better way or is that? The Holy Spirit wants to help you choose God's you know, direction in that way. There might be like a real painful thing that you're going through where it could be pain in your body, pain in your soul, and you might not know how to pray. The Holy Spirit can help pray in those areas. So this is what we're talking about here. The Spirit wants to help our weaknesses. Now, interesting, the God's Spirit does not remove our weakness but God's Spirit helps us in our weakness. So there isn't, like, it's not saying that he's going to remove the weakness, but in that weakness, he wants to help us, and in the end, there can be results that get us out of that place. But it, it doesn't say it's going to remove a weakness, because we always have the flesh. You know, the weakness it's talking about is our flesh. We don't know everything. Our flesh isn't perfect, but the Holy Spirit will help us in our weaknesses. So getting a little theological, because I want to make sure that you know that I'm just not even, I'm, I'm not trying to give an opinion out here. I'm not trying to twist anyone's arm. 
but I'm really doing like Jesus told Peter, if you love me, feed the sheep. I feel responsible as a pastor to make sure we look into everything and we don't put something aside because somebody told me that's of the devil and, and I know it's not of the devil and I'm not going to be afraid and we're going to look into the word and see what this says here. So look at this. This is what Matthew Poole's commentary says. It, it says, concerning help with our infirmities. It says, the word imports such help as when another of greater strength steps in, that's the Holy Spirit, and sustains the burden that lies too heavy upon our shoulders. So that's what the Matthew Poole commentary says about Romans 8, 26. Here is the Barnes notes on the Bible. It says, this word helpeth properly means to sustain with us, with us, to aid us in supporting. It is applied usually to those who unite in supporting or carrying a burden. So I remember I, uh, a friend of mine, I, I was the best man at his wedding years ago when I was really young, and he had one of those upright pianos, and then after they got married, I helped him move. Well, before they got married, we, we moved him into the, the apartment he got, and I didn't know, he, you know he was so strong. I mean, I knew I was strong back then. But, he, he, but we, we got on each side of the piano, and we picked it up, and we went up three, three stairs. I thought, man, I can't even believe we did that. And I mean, I, I thought, I mean, I could do that, just playing around. <laughs> just joking. All right, playing around. But nonetheless, see, it's saying that it's somebody that would do that is how it says it. It's applied usually to those who unite in supporting or carrying a burden. So you unite, okay? The meaning may be thus expressed, he greatly assists or aids us. See, that's the Holy Spirit on how he wants to help us in prayer. And then here's the Benson commentary. It's the word, and I can't pronounce that word, it's all Greek, um, uh, rendered here, helpeth. It's the word helpeth. Literally expresses the action of one who assists another to bear a burden by taking hold of it on the opposite side and bearing it with him. See, that's, that's really the one I was talking about with the piano. I uh, kind of got mixed up there. But that's like getting on either side. And it, as persons do who assist one another in carrying heavy loads. So my friend surprised me on that side, and he picked up that piano. But together, we could pick the piano up. There was no way we could pick it up alone. Uh, there's just certain things that we can't do without God, and he gave us his Holy Spirit to help us in prayer. So if we just summarize this, well, just, just one last thing. So this, a little more about the Greek word helpeth. So I can't pronounce it, but it has the word S-U in it, son. It's, it's a combination of words, and son means together with. Then it has the word anti, A-N-T-I, which means against. Then it has the word tambano, which means to take hold of. So when you put those three words together, and that's why it's so hard to pronounce with three words together, here's what it means. It means take hold of together with against. So you take hold together with against. And so whatever needs pray, prayed out, the Holy Spirit comes in, and the Holy Spirit takes hold of whatever that is with us against that thing. And so this is why we want to make sure we look into the Word and not leave anything out, because we need this help. We all have our flesh. We, we're, we're not perfect. We always don't know how to pray, but we have this help. So with that said now, let's go into Scripture more. Let's look at the urgency of the early apostles concerning the Holy Spirit. So you go back in the book of Acts, but uh, b before we do, I'm going to just pick up on one thing. You know, I told you about my brother Joe. He was born again. He received the Holy Spirit on the same day. My brother Joe received the Holy Spirit just an hour or two and spoke in tongues right after he received Jesus as Lord. So he, then he came home and he told me this story because I wasn't there when it happened. And so then when I received Jesus, I thought the same thing would happen to me, and it didn't happen. So what would be, I would go alone in my bedroom, and I would just lay on the bed, and I'd say, okay, Lord, I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to lay here, and I'm waiting for you to move my mouth, take control of my tongue, and move my lips, and pray through me in tongues. And nothing happened. Because, uh, you know, that's not the way it works. We'll see. But so then, because I was a baby Christian, and I didn't know what the Scripture said, I thought, it was God's will to do that with my brother, but it's not God's will to do it with me. 
And so I guess I'm not going to have this. And then the man that led my brother to the Lord, his name was Lou Shabu. I went to him because he was born again and older, but he still had, diff- even though he, God used him to lead us to the Lord, he had some different views uh, of scripture than what I do now. But when I went to him, he said, well, he said, it, it's not, it was God's will to do that with your brother. It's not God's will to do that with you. It's not God's will that you're filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues. He said, it was God's will that your brother is. He said, your brother's special. And then he said, and you're not. You know, which, you know, hey, I grew up as a, as a tradie. I could take any, I, I, I don't get offended very easy. You know, if you, tradies understand what I'm talking about, the way you talk to one another it, it, where you work. So that, that wasn't a big thing for me. Um, but, but, I, but I thought, well, you, you really did not read the book on how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> but, uh, but that said, so that's where I was at thinking, okay, this man knows God better than me. He knows the Bible. He said it's not God's will for me to be filled with the Spirit. And, and so, fine, I'm not special either. You know, okay. But here's, here's the thing. I, what happened was uh, I went to an underground meeting in a Catholic church in Niles, Ohio. It was Mark Carmel Catholic Church, Niles, Ohio. It was in the basement because the charismatic Catholic priest that was the associate pastor there, he brought in what they call a Protestant priest, a Protestant minister. That means you're not Catholic, you're protesting. And we went into the basement, (laughs) you know, and and he taught from Scripture how to receive the Holy Spirit, okay? And so... So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. And just so you know, I I might make some funny jokes here. I I want to make it clear. I respect the whole body of Christ, and people that receive Jesus are going to be in heaven for eternity. They're my brothers and sisters. And so even though I might make a little joke here or there, I respect the entire body of Christ. Just sometimes it's nice to laugh, okay, at others' expense. No. (laughs) All right. So let's look at this scriptural progression here. So John chapter 9, because it it will explain a lot of stuff. John chapter 7, I mean, in verse 39, it says, now, this is Jesus before he died. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were not to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is saying this about the Holy Spirit, basically saying, you can't have it until I die shed my blood, I'm raised from the dead, and then you can have it. That's basically what what he's saying. And then you go and you move to John chapter 20. So how many, that's like 13 chapters ahead. This is after Jesus died and after he was raised from the dead. So here's what he says here, or does. He says, after saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So just like a little brief thought about Jesus, he never wasted any words, never. He's the only one that ever walked on the earth that said everything correctly. He never said, you know how th- something can come out of your mouth the wrong way and it c- can hurt people and, and just people, you know, we, we, we say stuff that we shouldn't say, etc. Jesus never did that. Jesus never wasted any breath. He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He wasn't playing around. So, you know, what happened when he did that? Well, that's what theologians say. That's when the church was born. That's when they were able to become Christians for the first time. They were born again, and the Spirit came in them. Here's the way the epistles explain the Gospels. So here's what Ephesians 1.13 says. In him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you heard the word of truth, so notice, you hear the good news, the word, the gospel, and when you believe. When somebody hears and they believe and they receive Jesus, they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's when the Holy Spirit comes in anybody that receives Jesus. So when Jesus breathed on them, they were already believers. They already believed in him. That's when the church was born. So then it's very interesting then as we do the progression here, we go from John 20, but we go to Acts chapter 1. Jesus is talking once again, and in Acts 1, 4, it says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. He doesn't waste words, but to wait. He says, wait, 
For the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of, uh, from me, and then look at this, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I don't know how many in that group were part of the ones that he breathed on, but there were in that group those that he breathed on. The church was birthed. They became born-again Christians, as we say. They had the Holy Spirit in them. But then Jesus is saying, now don't, don't go out and do anything yet. You have to wait. You have to wait for this promise. You have to wait for this. Okay? So what is that saying? Because, you know, like, Jesus himself would not make a mistake. So it appears, and I mean, I, I'm truly convinced, but I'm just saying it in a little, uh, if anyone struggles with this, what it appears to me is that Jesus is saying there's two different, we could say, experiences. But we could say that there is the born again, where you receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit does come in you. You'll be up in heaven for eternity. But then there is being filled with the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you speak in other tongues. And that's like Jesus himself. And so you understand that when somebody tells me, oh, you speak in tongues, you're of the devil, I think, well, you might think that, but I know I'm not of the devil. And I think we all, you know, can see in Scripture. But we're not going to stop there. I got, I got some more Scriptures here to prove this. I believe it, at least for me, it proves it. So these were believers. He, he breathed on believers. They received the Holy Spirit. But then he said, you wait. And then you jump, and then right after he did that, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because we know in that group of, of men, there were some that they thought Jesus came to get rid of Rome. They, they were slaves to Rome, and they never really got it that Jesus didn't come to, you know, to deliver them from the Romans. Jesus came to deliver the world from sin. So they, they said, when are you going to come back to, you know, restore Israel, the kingdom? And then he said, it's not for you to know. He kind of like immediately changed the subject. That happened in verse 6 and 7. But then look at verse 8. Here's where he put the weight of what he wanted to say. That's not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, O-N, on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, he's saying, like, hey, your responsibility, my responsibility and your responsibility wasn't to, to free Israel from Rome, but your responsibility is to preach the good news, to demonstrate the good news, and that's what frees people from sin. You're thinking about being freed from Rome, but I came to free people from sin, and you need the Holy Spirit, and you need power to get that job done. That's basically what he's saying, okay? So remember earlier... Um, they believed and they received the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathed on them. But then, and that's when the Holy Spirit came in them. But now this is what Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. Now let's keep progressing through here in Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. It says here, it says, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that the Sumerians had received the word of God, what happens when you believe and receive, that's when you become a Christian, they sent them Peter and John. Well, that's pretty urgent. They're in another place. They're in Jerusalem, and they go to Samaria because they heard somebody receive the word who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, they were serious about this in the book of Acts. And then look at verse 16. For he had not yet fallen on them, O-N, on them, any of them. But look at this. But they had only been baptized in the name of, not of John the Baptist here, but in the name of the Lord Jesus. You're only baptized in water after you receive Jesus as Lord. We know that. All the baptisms we've done here, you have to be a Christian to be water baptized. So here what we see here is they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means when they received him, they heard that, you know, in Jerusalem that the Samaria had received him. That means they were born-again Christians the Spirit was on the inside of them, but they, the apostles went that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Well, they had the Holy Spirit in them, but what you see is they said it, it, the Holy Spirit did not fall on any of them. So then, verse 17, then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. 
See, they already believe. So uh, I'm just showing you from Scripture, this is like a scriptural thing here. I'm not making any of this up. And this is very helpful. Now, another interesting thing in, in verse number 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Simon was a sorcerer. He wasn't a Christian. But what did he see? Because let me ask the question. Can you see the Holy Spirit? You can't see the Holy Spirit with your eyes, right? Not possible. To, Jesus even said that in John chapter 3. You can't see the Holy Spirit with your eyes. So what did Simon the sorcerer see when they laid hands and they received the Holy Spirit? Well, I truly believe that they began to speak in other tongues, and that's what he heard, and that's what he saw. There was, that was what he could see and hear, because you can't see the Holy Spirit with your eyes. So you can see the urgency in the book of Acts on how important they thought it was that every Christian had this. So what, what we see there, and then uh, let's go over, to, let's do this other scripture, Acts 19 and verse 6. Look at this. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. It's right in the scripture. Now, there's people that say, well, that stopped when the last apostle died. Here's a, here's a thought. Well, if, if the epistles are for the church, did the church end when the last apostle died? No. Well, the book of Corinthians has a bunch of teaching about tongues in it. Why would the Holy Spirit have Paul write an epistle that was about so much about tongues if it was all going to cease when the last apostle died? Because that's another argument. I don't think he would have done that. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, we, 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 this is something that can really help us. Not, I'm not saying what I'm, I'm not referring to the fact that I just made a point. What I'm saying is the Holy Spirit can help us when we pray. That's what I'm talking about. So we see that here that salvation and the infilling of the Holy Spirit are two separate experiences. So Jesus is, now let's go and look at one more time. In John 14, 17, here's what Jesus said. He said, the spirit of truth, the world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. So there again, Jesus says, you can't receive something you don't know or see, but you do know him because he remains with you. That was before Jesus died and rose again, so they couldn't have him, but he says he remains with you. In other words, when Jesus ministered, the Holy Spirit was there, but then he said, and will be in you. So that's when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes in you. But then you go over to the book of Acts again, and Jesus says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the other ends of the earth. So you see again, Jesus talks about the Spirit in you and the Spirit on you. So we could say like, you know, the Holy Spirit, we could say these two things, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and the Holy Spirit also comes on us. So there's a dwelling in, and there's a coming upon a dwelling in, and there's a coming upon. And so that brings us to the last thing that I wanted to look at today, and that's how I was filled with the Holy Spirit and how you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So um, I, I know that I was hungry for it, and so I, I realize it with, with everyone here today, I, I don't know unless the Lord would show me who's hungry or who isn't, but I'm going to minister this anyway. All I know that I was hungry and I wanted it, and I got it. So you remember I was going into my bedroom asking the Lord to fill me. I was waiting for him to move my lips and make my tongue speak in tongues, and that didn't happen. Then the man that led my brother to the Lord, Lou, uh, and, and myself to the Lord, he told me it wasn't God's will for me to have it, and, and et cetera, my brother was special. So then my brother came with me, my brother Joe came with me to the underground meeting at Mark Carmel Catholic Church, that the Protestant minister was speaking at. And so Joe, my brother, was already filled with the Spirit, but he just came to support me. So they brought uh, the man in, and he taught from the Word. A lot of the scriptures we already looked at, that's where I learned those scriptures from. That night, he was making those scriptures clear. They really helped me. But then he gave an altar call for us to be filled, and then he did three things right before he had us come up. 
There was only about 50 people in the basement there. And, uh, and I can tell you that I was so timid when I was in school, like in high school, if we had to give a report, I would do the report, but then when I went up to give it, I got so afraid of standing in front of people, my heart started to beat, my face was all red, my ears were really red, and I, I tried to talk, and eventually I couldn't talk, and I just walked down the aisle, and I gave the report to the teacher and said, sorry. And so what happened is I got, we, that's back in the days, I don't even know if Australia ever did this, but you, you, had, you either got an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F. They skipped an E for some reason. But, um, so I got a lot of Ds and Fs, okay? And it brought my grade average down because I couldn't do public speaking. So I was just a baby Christian, and believe me, when he gave that altar call, I was shaken. I was very afraid. But I just thought, I'm going to do this. So I took a step, and I went up. I'm so glad I did. But here's what he did before. He gave these three final points. He said, number one, he said, being filled with the Spirit is for everyone. And so he went to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and this really ministered to me. It said, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then this, this verse has hit me, verse 39, for the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And I thought, wow. So it's for you. He's talking to the Jews. Then he said it's for your children. But then he goes and, and, and he said, but all who are far off. And I thought, wow. That, he was saying that way back in Jerusalem somewhere in Israel. And it was almost like 2,000 years ago. And now over here in little Youngstown, Ohio, this little Italian guy, you know, uh, is in the basement of a Catholic church almost 2,000 years later. I was one of those ones that were far off, far down the road. But I thought, it's for me. Then, then he goes, he just wants to make sure, he says, everyone. Every, now, I don't believe the Holy Spirit when he inspired these uh, you know, who wrote the book of Acts, I don't believe uh, that the inspiration was tainted. I believe there's accuracy in the scriptures. So he says everyone. So let me just say this uh, before we look at the next one. If Jesus is your Lord, you're saved, you'll spend eternity in heaven. There is no guilt or condemnation at all. So there's going to be an invitation today, but this is just, if you want this, because it can assist you in your Christian life, and it can assist you in prayer, it just, it's just wonderful. You'll be welcome to come up today. But you don't have to leave here feeling any kind of guilt or condemnation, but I highly encourage you, it's a wonderful thing to be filled with the Spirit uh, and speak in tongues. And I, and I, you know, so let's go on. So, that spoke to my heart, and I thought, it's for everyone. Because you remember, Lou, and my, I first of all thought, it's not for me, must not be God's will. And then Lou, in a sense, confirmed it. But then the scripture just kind of, the scripture can just overrule or overturn wrong beliefs. And when I heard this, I thought, it is for me, it's for everyone. So that got me. And then number two, he said, the scripture shows that we pray and ask for it, and it's God that fills us. And there's other scriptures, but here's this one in Acts chapter 8, verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, and who came down and prayed. So we're going to do a prayer today. And then that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Our, our ministry team is going to be ready today. Uh, they're all on. Uh, we have extra people ready today for anyone that would like to come and receive the Holy Spirit. But we'll pray and then we'll lay hands, and then we'll work with anyone who wants to have this. Number three, here's the last thing, is the worship team can come. Uh, but the last thing then is, here's what he said that really helped me. But we must cooperate with him and do the speaking. That got me. That was like icing on the cake, because 
I would lay in bed and I say, okay, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit, you know, and I was waiting for him to make my mouth move and my tongue, and it never happened. And then he said, but you, we must cooperate with him. It's just not all him, and it's not all you. It's both you and him. And then he, this scripture in Acts chapter 19 and verse 6, he brought this out. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking. And he, he emphasized that. He said, notice that they began speaking. God didn't make them do it, but they, be, they, they had, it was a choice they made. They didn't have to, but they chose to. So when you, there's prayer, lay hands, but then I had to do something. So I went up. He really helped me with these three points. I was shaken, very afraid, and I went up and stood in front of him, and he laid hands on me, and then he said, okay, he said, and he even said this when, he, when I was standing in front of him, he said, now, uh, he brought up that Jesus said, if you pray and ask for the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to give you a stone, I'm not going to give you a serpent. He said, so it's important for you to know that when I pray and lay hands on you, you're not getting anything from the devil. And I don't, you know, and so, you know, because people, they'll try to make you think that, or the devil himself will speak in your ear. He said, you, when I pray and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, you're only going to get the Holy Spirit. So he really made that clear. So I'm standing there, and he lays hands on me, and he prayed. But then it was my, in a sense, my turn, and I had to open my mouth, and I had to start speaking. And I did. And I've been around now for, you know, over 40 years, and I've been around when people, we actually had a, a young girl in the eight, uh, 830 service, her and her mother came up, and I was standing here, in the, and there was music going on, and Jenny worked with her, and when Jenny laid hands and prayed and all that, I could hear her speaking in tongues all the way up here on top of the music. But then her mother was not nearly as bold, and it was, it's so you can't compare, but she just received it like that. I was kind of timid. I wasn't very loud, and I felt like my speaking in tongues was very real simple. It almost sounds like, you know, <clears throat> The Italians, and I, you know, my father and grandfather used to do, especially my grandfather, it was kind of a Greek-Italian thing. He would go like this thing like, la, 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 pesci stoka bakala. You know, it was about baklava and, and fish, fish and bakla, you know, the Greeks and the Italians. And he would do this la, la, la thing, you know, and th I heard that growing up, you know. And, uh, but my tongue, when I spoke in tongues, it almost sounded like la, la, la. It was almost like I'm thinking, ah, is that an Italian tongue? No. I'm just, I'm just kidding around. But I'm just saying it was a very simple tongue. But as I continued on in the following weeks, it, it became more complex or complicated. So d d don't let the devil lie to you if you come up today. And, um, and maybe you'll come up and you think, oh, that, it's just so simple. Is that really God? I thought that. It was God. And it made a change in my life. So I want to pray. Uh, Father, I thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, I first of all lift up anyone that doesn't know Jesus as Lord. The first step before being filled with the Holy Spirit is making Jesus Lord. So Father, I thank you that you speak to any of those by your Spirit that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord. Uh, and, and just convict them by your Holy Spirit that they need a Savior. They can't save themselves, Father. And they are welcome to come forward today. And then, Father, I just thank you for all those, Father, that are here uh, that are not filled with the Holy Spirit, Father. I, I thank you that your work, you, you are the one that gives increase with the word. So I thank you that you've taken the scripture and you are speaking and making it very clear to people's hearts. And truth sets all of us free. And when we have truth, we act on it. So I thank you, Father God, for each person here today that there's salvation available and there is Holy Spirit available and I thank you for that in Jesus name praise the Lord so I'm going to invite all of you to stand and our worship team is going to begin to minister and our our ministry team will be here to assist you